September the 13th, 1759. A steep rock face rises 200 feet above the river. The only access to the top, a narrow goat path. James Wolfe has ordered all the landing craft to drift down the river and the troops to scale this forbidding face to a field he has never walked. All night, the British army climbs. in the morning on the Plains of Abraham. James Wolfe and his commanders survey the field. He has only seen the plains through a telescope three days ago. An abandoned farmer's field, uneven, filled with scrub. Wolfe has placed himself between two armies. On one side, Montcalm's main force is at Beauport, an hour's march away. But behind Wolfe, there is another French army, 2,000 men scattered along the St. Lawrence under Bougainville, who can mobilize within a few hours. Wolfe is gambling, Montcalm will take the bait. If Wolfe can't tempt Montcalm into a quick battle here this morning, his position is militarily desperate. Montcalm quickly mobilizes, but he's uncertain about the British invasion plan. He sends 5,000 men towards the Plains of Abraham and leaves the rest of his force to guard the Beauport trenches. The Marquis de Vaudreuil sends a courier to Bougainville. A quarter to seven, September 13th to Monsieur de Bougainville. It seems quite certain that the enemy has attempted a landing. Monsieur le Marquis de Montcalm has just left. As soon as I am sure of what is happening, I will notify you. No script. The enemy forces seem considerable. They are more than considerable. By eight in the morning, 4,000 men are assembling on the plains of Abraham. But the British are not alone. In the woods and cornfields around the plains, 400 Canadian militia and Indian snipers have rushed from Quebec to pin the enemy down while Montcalm's troops mobilize. They are the first to engage the invader. <laughs> Lieutenant John Knox sees men falling around him. What galled us the most? was a body of Indians and other marksmen they had concealed in the corn opposite to the front of our right wing and a coppice that stood opposite to our center. Eight thirty. Montcalm's army is approaching the plains of Abraham. But before this day, these men have already traveled thousands of miles with different motives. For the French officers, this is another encounter among many in the Imperial Wars of Europe. Colonel Etienne Guillaume de Senazaire, an aristocrat who's fought in Italy, Bavaria, and the Netherlands. This morning, it's Quebec. Captain Jean-Baptiste Duprat, a commoner who rose through the ranks, 
fought in Italy, Bavaria, and the Rhine. Fiac Francois de Montbéard, commander of the French artillery, veteran of the War of Austrian Succession. The soldiers they're leading are also thousands of miles from home, but they're here because they have little choice. Most are from the cities. They are the landless, the surplus labor of France. Carpenters, apprentice wig makers, cloth cutters. Men like Joseph Duzet, Antoine Moret, Barthelmy Gerard. Most had never even heard of Quebec before they were shipped here. Wheeling to the right from Colin into line, right wheel. They're not much different from the men waiting for them in the British lines. The 35th Regiment is recruited largely from Ireland. Many are farmers displaced from their land. Michael Clinton. John Darby, Abel Skittle, Irishmen who have spent most of their time enforcing the British occupation of their own country. The English soldiers here are the jobless apprentices of Britain's clothing factories and shipyards. Others have a different story. The Fraser Highlanders. Their families were evicted from the Scottish Highlands by the British. The young men had no alternative but to join the very army which destroyed their way of life. James Thompson. John Fraser. Alexander Fraser. These men have nothing left to lose. Marching in the ranks of Montcalm's regiments, however, are hundreds of men who have everything to lose. Fathers and sons of the great Canadian families. D'Argenteuil. Courtemange, Repontigny. Unlike the French soldiers, the Canadians are defending their homes and their way of life. Francois Clermont Boucher de La Perrière. At 51, he feels his age. I can no longer see clearly now, he says, though I have glasses on my nose. Not far from him, the next generation of his family, René Amable Boucher de Boucherville. The Bouchers are defending almost 150 years of family and history. Charles Deschamps de Boisbert spent two years protecting fleeing Acadians from the British. He leads the Acadian militia this morning. Under him, Joseph Trahan, 18, an Acadian who escaped the deportation. This morning, he's a refugee and a soldier at arms. The British Army now numbers 4,441 men. To increase their firepower, Wolf has ordered them to load two lead balls in their muskets instead of one. To stretch his army out over the widest possible distance, Wolf orders his men to form in two long thin lines rather than the usual three. One of the first to arrive is the French artillery commander Montbéard. 
he scans the plains below him. The British line is a mile wide. When Montcalm arrives, he's still uncertain. The British position seems so reckless. But he doesn't know if this is their full invasion force or if they will attempt a second landing at Beauport. He can attack, or he can wait for Bougainville to arrive with reinforcements. The fate of Quebec and of Canada rests with Montcalm's next decision. September the 13th, 1759. James Wolfe is desperate. He's placed his army in a precarious position, hoping the French will attack him. The Marquis de Montcalm is shaken and uncertain. Is this the real British invasion or a diversion? The battle for North America will unfold here on an abandoned farmer's field a mile from Quebec. It is 9.30. The real battle has not yet begun. For 30 minutes, the British artillery pummels the French line to create disorder while the army is still forming on the hill. Montcalm decides he will not wait for Bougainville's reinforcements. He will strike at the British this morning. He rides to his artillery commander, Montbéard. I spoke for a moment with Monsieur le Marquis de Montcalm, who told me, we will not be able to avoid the battle. If we give them enough time to establish themselves, we will never be able to attack with the kind of army we have. Montcalm orders a general advance. At approximately 10 o'clock, the Battle of the Plains of Abraham begins. It is a textbook maneuver. Montcalm's army will advance in a massive column. It will sweep down the hill and smash the thin red line. But the French line that started down the hill is uncoordinated, and after a short distance, the first mistake. Someone gives the order to halt the advance and fire. volley is pointless. The British are far out of range. The French resume the advance, their lines more confused and disordered with every step. Wolf's soldiers wait. French are within 40 yards of the British, they form for their second volley. This time they can see the faces of the men in the British line.
French reload, the British take position to fire. Back, ready! Finally, in the smoke and confusion, James Wolfe issues the most important military command of his life. Devastating. A mile wide burst of concentrated fire. The French line is dazed but stands its ground. Then the Highlanders unleash an advance with broadswords that can slice a man in half. Joseph Trahan of the Acadian Militia is right in front of them. I can remember the Scotch Islanders flying wildly after us, with streaming plaids, bonnets, and large swords, like so many infuriated demons. British bayonets draws closer. Confusion finally crumbles the French line. of Abraham has lasted barely 15 minutes. Sometime just after the British volley, James Wolfe is struck by a fatal shot in the chest. At the crest of the hill, Montcalm is engulfed in a stream of retreating men. Sometime in the next few moments, he is struck by a musket ball below his ribs. Most of the French flee up the hill towards the walls of Quebec. With them, Joseph Trahan. I was amongst the fugitives and received in the calf of the leg a spent bullet, which stretched me on the ground. I thought it was all over for me, but presently I rose up and continued to run. The British are within reach of the gates of Quebec, with the Highlanders leading the charge until they are stunned by a barrage of fire from the surrounding woods and fields. Oh! Hundreds of Canadian militia and Indians cover the retreating French army. The first wounded are brought to the General Hospital and to Marie de la Visitation. We were in the midst of the dead, the dying, which were brought to us by hundreds. Many of them are friends, our relations. It was necessary to smother our grief and extend ourselves to relieve them. Even though the French vastly outnumber the British, Vaudreuil has decided they will not fight again the next day. He orders the soldiers to abandon Quebec and Beauport. 
Some of the citizens stone them and shout, cowards. The battlefield is left now to the dead and the dying. Colonel Etienne Guillaume de Senazergue, mortally wounded, will die the next day. Francois Clément Boucher de La Perrière, who fought today with his eyes failing him, will die by evening. James Wolfe lived only a few minutes, long enough to hear that he had defeated the French. His body will be sent back to England, where he will be the empire's newest hero. He was 32 years old. Louis-Joseph, the Marquis de Montcalm, will survive for one more day. His body is put in a makeshift box because there are no coffins left, and buried in a hole made by a British cannonball. He was 47 years old. One thousand, three hundred men were killed or wounded on the Plains of Abraham. The Canadians from the parishes and cities of New France. The youths of the English Midlands. The dispossessed of the Scottish Highlands. The unemployed from Normandy and Provence. All will be buried, French and English together, in large common pits on the plains. The location of their graves will never be marked. Ten days after the battle, the French artillery commander Montbéard makes an entry in his journal. Twenty times I have picked up my pen and twenty times sorrow has made it fall from my hands. How can I bring to mind such overwhelming events? We were saved and now we are lost.